So th thank you all for coming. Um, this paper, as the, the title on the, um, on the slides and on the paper itself uh, states, is really preliminary. So this, these are my, my first interesting or what I think are interesting results uh, uh, from my project under the Electoral uh, Integrity Project uh, examining the, the causes of violence uh, surrounding elections in non-democratic contexts. Uh, and I'm, I'm especially interested in the temporal period directly around elections and whether elections can serve as a contributing factor or a spark, uh, uh, um, is the, the term I use in the paper, for violence uh, in societies that may be already prone to violence, but n um, something might push them over the edge uh, where to where the violence, the violence actually takes place. Um, and I think of violence in, in, in studying elections in uh, uh, two different ways. Uh, one is, is electoral violence uh, directly coming out of the elections, and the other is um, bigger issues of what, are, what I call political instability. And I'll go into both of those in more detail and show results for both of those kinds of violence uh, a bit later on. So a, as you may expect, uh, this, is, this is a quantitative study um, to, to test some general uh, hypotheses that, that I came up with um, in, you know, in proposing, proposing this project and that I think are interesting starting points for thinking about uh, uh, elections and political conflict uh, in non-democratic regimes. <coughs> So first thing, and uh, um, I realize that uh, these, these two general types of, of non-democratic regime, regimes can and perhaps analytically should be broken down further as, as my work goes on. But I want to start from the, the most general uh, and see what sort of analytical traction and, and um, findings I can get. So, Dividing non-democratic regimes into generally fully authoritarian regimes, uh, which really do not allow uh, the three elements in, that I think are theoretically relevant and three elements in the measure I use, which is from the, the polity data set, do not allow meaningful participation, uh, do not allow uh, uh, meaningful competition and do not place meaningful constraints on the executive. So those are the, the basic components of the polity index that I use. And two of them, participation and competition, are generally recognized, I think, in, in, in de uh, definitions, political science definitions of regime type. The third constraint on the executive, I think, is also important. And theoretically, I like it. and so I. I tend to like the polity index, although I recognize the, the problems that, that, uh, that uh, analysts have with it and the issues that arise uh, in particular at the study of violence. But I, I'm not going to address issues of the polity index today. Um, in terms of elections in full, fully authoritarian regimes, I would expect ele elections to be intended to exclude the opposition or intended to be a tool of repression or, or exclusion. Uh, so I think of elections in, in China or elections in the former Soviet Union, uh, um, elections in Myanmar until, until recently. Fully authoritarian regimes use elections uh, as a way to create some sort of political process uh, that, that uh, leaves the opposition out and may frustrate the opposition. Um, Mixed regimes, uh, which have some degree of participation and or competition and or constraint on the executive, uh, may have some real, uh, some real uh, um, um, opening for genuine opposition or alternative uh, uh, 
political leaders in, in their elections. So th this is the basic difference. Uh, um, and it can come, say, in, in the process of a transition, or it can come just as part of the political system that exists. One of my favorite electoral experiences, personal electoral experiences, was when I was living in Singapore. And although I wasn't a voter, I was watching the election that, that, uh, that happened. And you know, Singapore allows some, some degree of, of opposition participation with a lot of heavy constraints. But the opposition in one election, I forget what year this was, didn't win enough seats. In fact, I think it didn't win any. Uh, and so they had to appoint some opposition members to the parliament uh, so that there would be some opposition. So the system sort of relies on including the opposition, even though you, would, you wouldn't call it a de democracy uh, by, by most definitions. It's non-democratic, but it's, it's mixed in some way. Okay, so I have two basic streams of logic uh, or, or uh, uh, s ways of thinking to generate hypotheses about when elections in these context, uh, contexts might lead to either violence immediately surrounding the election over who's won and who's lost and whether you're, whether who's going to take power, or who's going to hand over power. Um, or it might also lead to this larger, more serious sort of violence that, that's often called political instability, such as sparking a civil war. Uh, and it, this logic relies on either the, lo uh, uh, the importance of the incumbents, the authoritarian rulers or non-democratic rulers being threatened, or the opposition being frustrated. Uh, and I hypothesize that either one of those can lead, can lead to violence, uh, or either one of those could provide an explanation for why, why you don't get violence in a particular situation. So the sort of the key uh, interacting variable, conditioning variable that I'm examining is electoral integrity. So when you have, uh, when you're thinking from the point of view of incumbents who don't want to give up office, electoral integrity is a threat. You know, if, if uh, of course, if you're going to win the election anyway, as for example in Singapore, the, the People's Action Party you know, could probably win a perfectly free and fair election. You know, that's, that's my guess anyway. Uh, electoral integrity might not be a huge threat, but still you don't want to have too much of it uh, uh, because politics can be unpredictable. And in most cases, as um, Mikhail Gorbachev found out in the former Soviet Union, if you let people vote, you may find out, you may be <coughs> rudely, rudely surprised that they don't actually like you so much. Uh, so electoral integrity presents this general threat to incumbents, but electoral mal malpractice allows incumbents to be secure and can, can uh, avoid violence by falsifying uh, uh, an election or having, having a fraudulent election that is used to maintain power and create some sort of facade of, of the political process um, or pro political contestation. And then the logic of the frustrated opposition is sort of the, the, the mirror image of that. So electoral integrity is something oppositions tend to like, because at least they have a chance if people will support them. And electoral malpractice uh, uh, will lead to some, some degree of violence coming out of that frustration because uh, you, you either have support or you believe you have support from the population. And then a, a further expectation I have is that electoral integrity threatens fully authoritarian regimes more than mixed regimes because fully authoritarian regimes don't have the tools to deal with opposition gains the way that mixed regimes do where they have some degree of competition or some degree of, of, of participation, et cetera, already built into the system. Rather, fully authoritarian regimes have more of the tools of violent repression. Okay, so the two outcomes that, that I'm interested in and most of the, or the best results I have are, are for, the, for the first kind here are violence that come around election time uh, and this onset of political instability.
Uh, so the violence right around the election time, I just I used this variable in the, in the um, uh, NELDA data set that measures whether there is, is violence directly before, during, or after an election that involves civilian deaths. Uh, and it's not, it's not defined, at least as far as I can tell in the documentation, not to find more than that, but that's a, you know, a reasonable def definition of, of electoral violence uh, or violence that comes around an election. Uh, and then the onset of political instability, I, I use data from the Political Instability Task Force, um, which measures uh, f four different things. So the onset of a civil war, either an ethnic civil war or a revolutionary civil war, where the the, uh, some group is trying to take over the state. Um, mass killing and gen what's what they define as genocide and, and politicide, so mass, mass violence against, against civilians perpetrated by the state or by one side in the Civil War, and what they call adverse regime changes, which are, are serious reversals of democracy, most often surrounded with or involving serious violence, like like coups um, uh, and, and other, other chain moves away from democratic or semi-democratic semi governance towards authoritarian, authoritarian rule. Um, so I thought these are two different sorts of violence, each of which might be sparked by elections. Okay. And the sort of the setup of the quantitative models is to interact the variables for regime type, in particular um, fully authoritarian regimes, and then I collapse these two partially democratic and partially authoritarian into a measure of mixed, mixed regimes, uh, just to start more simply and, and more, more generally. I'm not sure I would have strongly different hypotheses for, for these two groups, at least at this stage. Um, and with these, these interactions of, of the um, regime type and, and my measure of electoral malpractice during elections, uh, I, I examine whether there's a difference for these regimes than, uh, than you would find in, in the fully democratic context. Um, Okay, and I'm, I'm glad to talk about the models and the measures and the data more, but I won't spend a lot of, lot of time on it. Just to note that if you add up the elections from either the institution and elections, proje institutions and elections project or the, the uh, NELDA data set, there are more elections, just slightly more, but more elections in the post-war period. Uh, uh, post World War II period in non-democratic contexts than than in democratic ones. Okay, okay. how am I doing on time? Uh, fine. fine. Okay. <laughs> um, so I I've come up with a a initial measure of electoral ma malpractice, which I just see as the the inverse of of electoral integrity, uh, and we can talk more about measuring this concept or whether that's, whether that's a fair statement um, later on. And I, I just used as an initial first cut measure all the variables that I could find in the NELDA data set that seemed to be related to uh, um, electoral malpractice and not to violence. Uh, so I wanted to get a, as clear a distinction as I could between between the dependent variable and the key independent variable. Uh, so theoretically, I expect the malpractice to lead to violence um, uh, rather than violence being part of the malpractice. So I, I didn't, well, I, I tried to exclude uh, uh, variables that measured violence against the opposition before, before an election, uh, although there is this measure of harassment uh, harassment in here, which may invo involve violence, but I'm, uh, it's not defined any, any, in any more detail in the, in the NELDA data set, as far as I can tell. Um, so not allowing opposition, no choice of candidates, uh, significant concerns, elections will not be free and fair, the opposition leaders prevented from running, 
The government harassed the opposition. Monitors denied the opportunity to be present, or monitors uh, refused to come due to concerns that the elections are, are not, not free and fair. And I just, I add these, the NELDA data set can record up to three rounds of an election in a, in a given election period or year. So I added for all three rounds, just did a simple additive index. Most elections have one round uh, and the maximum value uh, on the index is eight. So it's, you know, it's not as if they're, we're getting huge, huge numbers of violations in the third round or, or something like that. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so the results from the, this uh, logit, logit model, logit regression um, on, on electoral violence as defined by NELDA. So, so during an election, if there, is, are there, if there are civilians killed before, during, or after, the election, uh, these are the factors that are associated with it in, in the model I've, I've done. And significant results at, a, at at least the 90% level are, are in bold, which you may or may not be able to see. Uh, but I've included the significance level, so it's uh, straightforward. Uh, and, and so what this shows in general or not in general, in specifically in democracies, electoral malpractice seems to seems to be associated with violence, because positive positive coefficient. Um, however, in when we well, and mixed regimes and autocracies in general have more electoral violence than than democracies. So the the reference category here is is democracies. They're they're left out. Um, when I interact my electoral malpractice um, indicator with mixed regimes and democracies, however, you get a negative and significant effect uh, in, in both cases and at least eyeballing the logic coefficients, the negative significant effect for autocracy is larger than, uh, is, is, the, is quite large, or larger than for mixed regime, which is also consistent with that expectation that, that um, uh, uh, autocracies are, are more threatened by electoral integrity than mix, mixed regimes. So the more malpractice autocracies have, the more specific they are, uh, even to a greater extent, at least judging, you know, eyeballing these coefficients, which, uh, you know, is, is, is not the final, final word for a logic analysis, but, um, you know, mixed regimes are also threatened by electoral integrity or have more specific out electoral outcomes when there is electoral malpractice. Uh, um, so this, I, I think this is, as far as my initial analysis, initial, initial ideas are concerned, this is sort of the most interesting finding so far. And I think the, the question is sort of given that, I mean, this, I think it's not terribly surprising that, you know, incumbents feel threatened and if they can't use malpractice, if they have some degree of electoral integrity in their elections, they may be more likely to use violence uh, against, against the opposition, which, you know, if it happens to do better than they, they expected. Um, I also, one of the problems that I think is important and needs more work, certainly in my models, is the 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 issue of endogeneity or the idea that uh, um, the incumbents probably choose both when to hold elections, how much electoral integrity they will have or malpractice they will commit, and also whether to commit violence. And so these things may be actually connected. And so the violence, or I'm mean, sorry, the integrity, integrity of the election may sort of be connected to uh, the violence itself. So you may say, well, you know, there could be some plot by the, by the leadership to, to say, well, we'll allow them to win a bit and then we'll, we'll repress them uh, um, or, you know, or something, something like that. So I, I think this is a serious concern and it's raised, raised by others as well. Uh, in, in the study of elections and violence in non-democratic context, especially as the, the non-democratic leaders have control uh, 
over everything, and they may be, may be related uh, in a way that, that uh, causes problems for my analysis. But what, I'm, what I wanted to point to is that I do try to include two variables in here. One is whether the election is held early or late, whether it varies from the scheduled electoral schedule, which might be an indication that you're, you know, you're, you're scheduling the election either to avoid violence or to, to find a, you know, the perfect time. You want to do it now because you want to repress the opposition. Uh, and whether the previous election was suspended, which turns out to be significantly related to, to violence. Uh, um, I'm not entirely sure of the implications of that for, for endogeneity. Okay, and then just quickly, um, I'll show the initial results for the political instability <laughs> onsets. I, because of the way I, I coded uh, this, um, it, these are, and I, I, sh I should have said, in the previous analysis, I'm only looking at election years, years of elections, because that's the only time that the NELDA violence data is recorded. But in, in political instability, you have data for all, all country years, all years uh, in, in the data set. So I'm, I'm examining whether elections are a factor or other things at, at other <coughs> times are, are a factor. Um, and so with this, uh, with this analysis, I took advantage of the fact that NELDA has monthly data and the political instability data also record months of start, start and end. So with a bit of uh, struggle with uh, uh, coding things month by month uh, and, and thinking about how to do this, I created a, a different sort of data set. And I could look at the month, month of an election, the month before an election, and the month after an election. Uh, and I found really, although uh, mixed regimes and autocracies uh, in general, seem to have more onsets of political instability. Whether uh, there's an election in this month, last month, or, or next month, uh, doesn't really impact that, that propensity towards political instability uh, in, in mixed regime, in non-democratic regimes, to an extent that's different than uh, in, in other regimes. So, the, the negative effect of elections, the Pacific effect during an election month before or after, uh, or the month before or after, you're less likely to get an onset of political instability uh, in, in states in general. So I, I think this is an interesting finding, this preliminary finding about elections and, and mm -hmm. instability. But when I ran uh, data in a different configuration examining, uh, which are in the paper, examining um, uh, electoral integrity and onsets of political instability, I found no association. Uh, so, so this sort of big kind of political violence uh, uh, is not associated to electoral integrity, at least in my, my initial analysis. So it's only the lower level uh, kind of violence that surrounds elections uh, that's at least so far associated. Okay, so my, my uh, quite tentative conclusions, uh, uh, which I think are nevertheless pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, threats to the incumbent are more important than frustration of the opposition in sparking electoral and violence in non-democratic settings. Um, and the issue of endogeneity, which I mentioned before, I think is something uh, that I need to think about uh, more, and I'd actually like to hear your, your comments on that. Uh, um, uh, in the Q&A session. And finally, you know, the next step in the analysis, the conditions under which electoral integrity might be increased uh, in, in non-democracies without increasing the likelihood of violence, I think is, is something that is interesting from a policy perspective uh, and also in, interesting from an analytical perspective. Uh, I think it, you know, I, I think I say in the conclusion of the paper that if, if the idea is that electoral malpractice helps states, non-democratic states avoid violence, then this just leads to awkward policy recommendations. You know, you can't say, well, falsify the elections, you know, we'll, we'll you know, that, that wouldn't be the, the World Bank or, or AusAid uh, 
policy. Let's, we'll give you some money to teach you how to falsify elections so they'll be as peaceful as possible. Um, uh, the, the policy relevance and also you know, relevance for topics of de democratization uh, will come in thinking about more nuanced conditions. So those are the results of my first cut uh, at, at the data and I really look forward to your, your comments. First of all, um, thanks for the invitation to participate in this project and um, comment on your commendable paper. Um, I think it's no secret that statistical analysis is not my strong suit. Um, so I'm going to leave it to the more numerate in the room to parse that and take it apart. Um, I do know one or two things about violence, um, <clears throat> having written about it, studied it done some on-the-ground research, so a lot of my comments are colored by that. But um, I also have to put on the table uh, that uh, not only am I pretty enumerate, um, but uh, I really think that um, based on my earliest experience, the one behavioralist course I took um, in my early in my career, I think it was Janice Stein's, where we were reading famous speeches by famous statesmen. I think there was one woman, Golda Meir. Um, and we were supposed to figure out what was the independent and dependent variable. This was the whole course. And it's the, um, uh, the one course I didn't do too well at McGill because I always thought the arrow was going both ways. It always, the variables always seem to be interdependent. And I have that trouble with your paper. I'm going to tell you why. Um, I don't think it's just the way my brain is wired, although that might be a possibility. Um, I think that um, with increased complexity, but most importantly, because of the over-mediated nature of electoral politics now, the ability to distinguish the independent and dependent variables has become increasingly difficult. Um, by over-mediated, I mean everything from you know, how um, it is um, the social media we were talking about last week, or so. Um, but um, over-mediated and over-interpreted, and that it's very difficult to discern motivation, intention, consequence, because of everything that happens in that space in between in the mediation. And that makes it very difficult then to maintain some of these distinctions. And what originally triggered these thoughts was, I did have a little bit of sense of deja vu here. Um, the debates that went on between uh, the, when we tried to distinguish in the, God, going all the way back to the 80s, um, where Jean Kirkpatrick was doing this distinction between authoritarian and totalitarian regimes. You probably watched too young for that thing. But Actually not too young. <laughs> okay. So Gray probably remembers some of this from, you know, it was basically an attempt um, to, um, apply social science to really what was an ideological, or give social science gloss to what I found to be, if not an ideological, certainly a value-laden argument. And I find that with a lot of statistical analysis and rational choice, what if you start to pull on a little bit, pull on the strings, you start to realize there's a mode of her hermeneutics operating. And I think there's a mode of hermeneutics here that we have to be sensitive to in these assumptions. And it comes with your ideal types, your typologies. Um, that I just, I, it doesn't sit very well because it assumes <coughs> that we all agree upon what constitutes violence, for one thing, when violence is a spectrum, you know, from psychic to and psychological to physical, forceful, um, laying on of hands. And some of the most, as Foucault has shown us, some of the most violent <laughs> forms of violence is when you never see the outward physical appearance of it. You know, and that's where I think um, Kirkpatrick's distinctions started to break down. And why I've always found in that same period, reading people like Micknick, Havel, or George Conrad, who wrote about the politics and anti-politics, about how you know, um, the little acts, not the big acts, of insubordination are more significant than the outright. Because once you've prevented violence, 
as a form of protest, uh, either psychically or with repercussions that are just the cost too high, then you have to study the smaller little gestures. And that's why I feel to really understand what's going on here, political science might not have the right tools. Now again, I'm a pluralist. I, I think that this supplements other people's work. I'm not saying it's either or, but I feel we're under-equipped, and we, um, in a sense, I can rather falsely um, wear the hat of a political scientist, where elections as theater uh, is more important, is rights of rituals of power, initiation, passage, um, and when does violence break out? And here I would really recommend a book by David Kurtzer, who's written on the rituals of violence in elections um, in, in non-traditional, non-Western societies, and he's an anthropologist. Uh, people don't seem to read this book much anymore, but I always find it very useful in understanding this. And why I still think Hobble and the power of the powerless um, um, is also insightful, in that he um, um, challenges this notion that, uh, you know, what, how, what are the manifestations of power and, and how does it work in totalitarian and authoritarian regimes. Um, I would also say anthropologists have an advantage because they can also understand how different cultural expressions of violence, where violence has catharsis as opposed to simply protest against a regime, some sort of psychological process against the repressive forms of violence that they, in mostly in post-colonial situations, and a lot of your studies, I think, I don't know how this model travels according to different societies. Maybe you can let me know. Can you say this is a robust model they can use not just in the African circumstances, but in Asia, and, you know, Singapore, and Africa? I mean, maybe we can talk about that. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the short answer is I, I haven't broken it down yet to different regions. Okay. Um, and um, my own little, you know, pet project and <clears throat> peeve on this is when we talk about over-mediation, is um, the role of visualization. Um, a lot of the violence now that's happening around elections pre the uh, toppling authoritarian regimes um, has to do with the power of images. Um, the image of a self-immolation, um, the um, you know, image of brutality. Um, um, and how does that become a causal factor in this mix? Um, you know, uh, what how, how effective are regimes now in preventing the flow of images? It, should that be a criteria index for whether a government is quasi-totalitarian, quasi-authoritarian? Um, I think that needs to be factored into any uh, analysis, the control of the flow of images and the manipulation, uh, the manufacturing. Um, um, I guess uh, my, my final thought on this is, you know, not on how intersubjective um, so many of these um, different interpretations are. I'm very much of the school, when you talk about um, what's internal and what's external um, to these elections, uh, here um, the intrusion and intervention of things that this Electoral Integrity Project I've been talking about, and Pippa did in her um, inaugural lecture last week, is that um, the breakdown of the local and the national from the global and regional, both because of monitoring, because of intervention of media, intervention of NGOs, um, makes it very difficult to have kind of isolated laboratory effect that you need for these kind of studies. Um, that would be my kind of hypothesis. But again, I'm a pluralist. I think that this is very good to test. You know, again, I'll resort back to um, the view that uh, the obvious and the familiar um, take on a certain commonsensical truth until we start to apply these kind of models. So any counterintuitive conclusions that come from this study, I think, are going to be very important. Um, um, you know, by defamiliarizing it through um, a new way of looking at the obvious. Um, it's helped me do that, and as well, um, you know, might have even dusted off some cobwebs in the part of my brain that normally doesn't get exercised. So thanks for that as well. <laughs>
Um, so should we just open it up to questions? Do you want to respond first, or how would you like to go? Jewish. Maybe um, while it's fresh, this thing. Yeah, sure. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, I guess my general response is, you know, thanks, thanks for for these comments, and I, I think they especially point to more things that I <laughs> that I can study or qualifications. Um, I, you know, I guess. I would need to think more specifically about how, say, global pressures for electoral integrity might also be affecting the outcome of violence in yeah. particular states at particular times that might, you know, might be an issue for the, the relationships I find. But I, I think before saying more, I would need to go away and think about, because you've raised general concerns yeah. about, I mean, in a sense, they're about endogeneity or to use statistical language or or just that it's spurious the cause the, the causal factors that I'm pointing to that connecting integrity and violence uh, as measured you know as as actually measured might might not be the causal factors there might be third factors or sets of factors well, the classic I mean I, I, I should give you more specificity but the early the case of this with the CNN effect is where you know, there was a random mob during the Haitian elections that um, basically you turn a camera on violence. And in one case, you know, where it looked like the U.S. might intervene to you know, maintain the electoral integrity, um, the ships literally turned around that were you know, in offshore because of this violence. There was still the post-Vietnam syndrome operating, or in this case, post Mogadishu. Uh, you know, you don't want to see American troops So it's just you know it's that's be one of more concrete example. Okay. Yeah. I think I've, I've I will need to go away and think think some more.